Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Benet Weiser. I'm the dean of the Annenberg School. And I wanted to welcome you all to the 23rd Annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture in Social Justice. The Annenberg School for Communication is so proud to be part of a long and collaborative partnership with the Center for Africana Studies. And this lecture series is a particular point of pride for um, us. We've been doing it for the past 23 years. As we witness more and more brazen attacks on critical discourse about race and higher education in the country, it is more important than ever for universities to be leaders in sustaining and supporting social justice efforts. This lecture series is part of Penn's annual celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. King, and it is also a way for us to show our commitment to the intersections between and within Africana studies, communication, race and gender studies, and social justice. I will say that the uh, honoree for tonight's award and lecture, Dr. Dorothy Roberts, has been an incredible, incredible influence in my life and in my scholarship for many, many years now. But now, I am pleased to introduce the interim president of the University of Pennsylvania and the Robert G. Dunlop Pro Professor of Medicine, Larry Jameson. We are all so fortunate that Larry has taken on this crucial role at this crucial time at Penn, around the country, and around the world. His achievements at Penn Medicine are legendary, including the development of a new strategic vision and goals for Penn Medicine over the next five years. I had the privilege of serving with him as a fellow dean for the past five months. I just became dean five months ago. Uh, before he became my boss. Um, and I know I speak for so many when I say we have such confidence and trust in his vision as a leader for our institution. So without further ado, the interim president of the University of Pennsylvania, Larry Jamison. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to one of the many events that we're holding to celebrate Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, beginning last week and continuing this week. And Dr. Benet Weiser, thank you for the kind introduction. For 23 years, this lecture in social justice has invited brilliant thinkers, writers, activists, policymakers, politicians, and academics to speak to our campus community. And each year, the speakers reflect on timely and challenging issues in the spirit of Dr. King. Social justice requires us to understand the hard realities of power and inequality. And it asks us to question and rebuild the structures that create these realities. I'll just ask all of you to think for a minute. In your own lifetimes, of the inequalities that existed before that to some extent have been addressed and also ask ourselves, you know, why did we either not see these or choose not to see these? And in my lifetime, we saw segregation eliminated. It was previously separate but equal. We've seen LGBTQ rights, disabilities, addressed. Now we think also about environmental justice. So all of us have to be very vigilant. And in Dr. King's vision, social justice requires us to constantly practice care, respect, and dignity for ourselves, but also for each other. And I wanted to quote from his 1967 address, where do we go from here? Dr. King said, and I quote, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And reciprocally, justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. 
So progress is, as he often reminded us, a constant struggle. And change is not an inevitable consequence of the passing of time. He showed us that we must think and we must act, guided by this knowledge of power and the feeling of love. That we must walk many different paths to arrive at justice. Legislative, moral, global and local, personal and institutional. It's an honor to have Dr. Roberts lecture this evening. In this spirit, her title is, Are Civil Rights Enough? And I'm sure she'll touch on the fact that 60 years ago, the 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed. And I also want you to reflect on this time when Martin Luther King was very influential, particularly with John F. Kennedy, before he was assassinated. And within five days of the assassination, Leonard, uh, Lyndon Johnson began an incredible effort to get this legislation through. And the history of that time is, is amazing. I had a chance to visit the museum of, of Lyndon Johnson where they have the recordings where he leaned on legislators left and right to get that legislation through. And it reminded me how close it came to not passing. So it's, it's an important milestone, this 60 year anniversary. Dorothy Roberts uh, is just an amazing intellectual. Among her many books, you know, I've read Fatal Invention as it touches on medicine and bioethics. It's an incredible history of the field of, of racism, the biology, the sociology, the policy. So I, I know you'll learn a lot from her interview tonight. She's a scholar at the first rate, always accessible. Her work improves lives and it makes change. And she's always in conversation with the communities that we serve. You'll also have a chance to hear from Presidential Penn Compact Professor of Africana Studies and a new faculty member here, Marcia Chatelain. And she's going to join Professor Roberts in conversation with you tonight. In these first few weeks of my interim presidency, I've been so grateful to everyone who organizes and participates in these MLK commemorative symposium events. I could ask for no greater sense of momentum towards healing our community and working hard to achieve what our intellects and imaginations tell us is possible, no matter the challenges ahead. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Wally Adabwanwi, the Presidential Penn Compact Professor of Africana Studies and the Director of Penn Center for Africana Studies. He's traveled the world as a student, scholar, and teacher, and it's great to have him with us here tonight. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Wale Adibangui. I'm the director of the Center for African Studies. Welcome. Tonight, you are in for a treat as you become part of a historic and timely dialogue around the question, are civil rights enough? This occasion is historic as you observe the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and timely given the significant events related to civil rights in the last two decades. As we grapple with the question, are civil rights enough? We also come together to celebrate the legacy of Dr. King by honoring someone who follows in his tradition of fighting for social justice. The Center for Africana Studies warmly welcomes you to the annual Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Award and lecture in social justice. We extend our sincere gratitude to Penn's interim president, uh, Dr. J. Larry Jameson, and Dr. Sarah Barnett Westner, the Dean of Annaberg School of, for Communication for their general support. Inaugurated in 2002, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s lecture in social justice is part of the university's annual celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. King. The lecture brings to campus national and international scholars and public figures who have committed themselves to social justice. Notably, participants in the past King lectures include the late Julian Bond, Charles Blow, Joy Reid, 
Black Lives Matter Movement founders, uh, Opa Tometi and Patrice Kulos, Julian Bond, Angela Davis, Trans Africa founder Randall Robinson, Afro Colombian civil rights leader Carlos Rosero, Cornel West, Nicole Hannah Jones, humanitarian actor and activist Ali Bolafonte, uh, Danny Glover, and Jesse Jackson, and many others. Now I will introduce you know, uh, our honoree and uh, her colleague who is going to have a conversation with her. Our moderator and discussant for this evening's uh, lecture is Professor Masha Chatelain. Dr. Chatelain is the Presidential Penn Compa Professor of Africana Studies. In 2016, the Chronicle of Higher Education named her as a top influencer in academia in recognition of her social media campaign at Ferguson Syllabus, which implored educators to facilitate discussions about the crisis in Ferguson, Missouri, in 2014. Professor Chatelain uh, is, is the author of South, uh, Southside Girls Growing Up in the Great Migration, which was published in 2015 by Duke University Press. And she teaches about women's and girls' history, the US civil rights movement, as well as black capitalism. Her latest book, Franchise, The Golden Arches of Black America, which was published in 2020, examines the intricate relationship among African-American politicians civil rights organizations, communities, and the fast food industry. She has received numerous awards for her franchise, that's the book, the 2020 book, including the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in History. If you want to clap for that, I can hold on. Thank you. A reviewer has this to say about the book, and I quote, thanks to Marsha Tatlin, I will never look at the fast food, at fast food the same way. She pairs burgers and fries with civil rights and black wealth, showing readers exactly what opportunity in America really looks like, unquote. In 2023, Chatelain was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She will be in conversation today with our honorary following her lecture. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our honoree tonight, Professor Dorothy Roberts. Professor Roberts' accomplishments are so vast that anything I say here will be an understatement. Yet, her stellar scholarly record pales in comparison to her character and commitment. She's a great reflection of what Dr. King said during the March for Integrated Schools on April 18, 1959, and I quote, Make a career of humanity. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a better person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in." Unquote. Dorothy Roberts is the 14th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor and George A. Ways, uh, University Professor of Law and Sociology uh, at this great university with joint appointments in the Department of Africana Studies and Sociology and the Law School, where she is the inaugural Raymond Pace and Saditana Mosel Alexander Professor of Civil Rights. She is also the founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society. An internationally acclaimed scholar, award-winning author, public intellectual, and social justice activist, she has written and lectured extensively on race, gender, and class inequalities in the United States and has been a leader in transforming public thinking and policy on reproductive freedom, child welfare, and bioethics. She is the author of the award-winning Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, which was published in 97 and then released again in 2017. Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, which was published in 2001, Fatal Intervention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, published in 2011, and Torn Apart, How the Child Welfare System Destroys Black Families and How Abolition Can Build a Save World, published in 2022, as well as more than 100 articles and book chapters, including race, in the 1619 Project book. Robert has served on the boards of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, Black Women's Health, 
Imperative, Center for Genetics and Society, Juvenile Law Center, and National Coalition for Child Protection Reform. And our work has been supported by fellowships granted by the American Council of Learned Societies, National Science Foundation, Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, the, Fo the Fulbright Program, Harvard Program in Ethics and the Professions, Stanford Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and Northeastern Institute for Policy Research. Recent recognitions of our work include election to the American Philosophical Society, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Medicine. She's also uh, been the, uh, the, she's also earned a prize from the Juvenile Law Center Leadership, the Leadership Prize, the Abo Abo Abortion Liber Liberation Fund of PA, Rosie Jimenez Award, New Voices for Reproductive Justice, Voice of Vision Award, Society of Family Planning Lifetime Achievement Award, and American Psychiatric Association Solomon Carter Fuller Award. Her scholarship and activism reminds us again of what Dr. King said, quote, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Interim President, ladies and gentlemen, fewer people are better placed to speak on the theme, are civil rights enough, than a scholar who has examined the history of race and subjugation and the contemporary manifestations of this pernicious history in their different inflections for black people particularly black women and children, who has interrogated the disproportionate representation of black children in the US foster care system and its effects on black community and the country at large, who has mobilized her unique combination of logic and sex sensitivity in exposing the foundational racism of the child welfare system while calling for radical change, and one who has examined the uses and misuses of science to invent new forms of oppression and perversions of the human body and spirit, and what all of these mean for our conception as well as practices of human liberty. Dr. Roberts combines the forensic insight of the legal scholar with the, so the social acumen and sensitivity of the sociologist, and she has, with superb intellect, utilized both assets in raising uncomfortable questions about why we have used our unparalleled human and material resources to build a society that, on the one hand, creates much less opportunities for human possibilities, and on the other, exposes tens of millions to so much precarity, devastation, and death. It is for this reason, and many, much more, that we are honoring her today. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our 2024 Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Social Justice Awardee, Professor Robert, uh, Dorothy Roberts. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you so much. And thank you for that gracious introduction, lengthy introduction, Wale. Thanks also, President Jameson, Dean Benet Wisner, and the Center for Africana Studies. I'm so blessed to call Africana Studies one of my homes here at Penn. I'm extremely honored. I can't express how honored I am to give this year's Martin Luther King Social Justice Lecture and to be in conversation with my amazing Africana colleague, Marsha Chatlin. And thank you all for coming out. This is a momentous year to reflect on the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in part because it marks the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, one of the crowning achievements of the freedom struggle that he devoted his life to. In his I Have a Dream speech, the high point of the 1963 March on Washington, just a year before the Civil Rights Act was passed, Dr. King observed, there are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? 
He goes on to answer, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. Police violence, residential segregation and housing discrimination, voter suppression, the sense that there's nothing for which to vote. King's words prior to the Act's passage might describe our situation 60 years later, after its passage. So we might ask ourselves, are we satisfied? Are civil rights enough? Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech might just as aptly have been called his fierce urgency of now speech. Alongside his dream of a truly free, equal, and democratic society manifesting at some point in the far off future, he declared, we have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. King's simultaneous dream of a just and humane future world and his call for action in the world right now, those reflect themes that I want to explore tonight. It is in the long, unfinished struggle for liberation, marked by remarkable victories and deep dissatisfaction, by vision and urgency, that I want to place the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Dr. King's radical political vision, and the current moment we find ourselves in. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 marked a tremendous victory of the black freedom struggle. Passed right on the heels of the March on Washington, Congress finally responded to a long-standing demand on the federal government to intervene more aggressively against Southern state officials' violent refusal to recognize black people's equal status. The Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, in employment, in public accommodations, and in federally funded programs. It also strengthened the enforcement of voting rights and school desegregation. It provided mechanisms for investigating and documenting continued racial discrimination and for making claims for redress. And it served as a foundation for subsequent Civil Rights Act, like the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Just think about the momentous place of the Civil Rights Act in the protracted legal history of racial injustice and struggle in the United States. During the era of chattel slavery, state and federal courts, including the US Supreme Court consistently ratified the slavery regime by interpreting key constitutional provisions and statutes in favor of enslavers. As the court summed up in its 1857 Dred Scott decision, the framers intended to embed slavery in the Constitution because they believed that black people, quote, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. After centuries of black rebellion and abolition movement and a bloody civil war, Congress enacted the 13th Amendment, prohibiting slavery and involuntary servitude throughout the nation, followed by the Civil Rights Act of 1866 over President Andrew Johnson's veto, and the 14th Amendment, extending the guarantee of full citizenship to black people as well as anyone born in the United States. Four million formerly enslaved people grabbed a short-lived opportunity to create their own economic, social, and political lives independent 
of white domination. But slavery's defeat was met by a white terrorist campaign to return newly freed black people to servitude and to reinstate white rule. It installed an official Jim Crow regime that treated black citizens as legal, legally inferior in every aspect of economic, social, and political life. It took a mass movement like never before entailing sustained organizing, marches, boycotts, strikes, sit-ins, rallies, arrests, jailings, beatings, an inspiring host of brilliant leaders, tens of thousands of everyday dedicated women, men, and children, many who were murdered, to topple Jim Crow and usher in civil rights. That's how important the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is. But like the victory over chattel slavery, the civil rights victory over Jim Crow was met by powerful efforts to reinstate white domination in new forms, what Michelle Alexander has famously called the new Jim Crow. The explosion of the prison population, and I would add the foster care population, both filled disproportionately with black souls both powerful means of disrupting and controlling black communities happened after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. Emancipation from slavery, the Reconstruction Amendments, and civil rights legislation all marked monumental strides toward a free society. But none achieved Dr. King's vision or that of freedom fighters before him. One of the reasons that civil rights have failed is the false view that in the passage of the civil rights laws, the civil rights movement did achieve all of its aims. The US Supreme Court makes the civil rights era the dividing line in its jurisprudence on racial equality. It treats the 1960s civil rights acts as if they vanquished completely state racism in America. According to this view, Apart from aberrational acts of overt prejudice by individual officials, the new civil rights ethos has purged the government of its white supremacist past. In its 2013 decision in Shelby County versus Holder, for example, the court struck down a key provision of the Voting Rights Act on grounds that it was no longer needed to protect against racist barriers to political power. A majority of Supreme Court justices embrace a colorblind political ideology, a key post-civil rights strategy developed by conservatives to preserve white domination in laws that appear race neutral on their face. As sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva writes in his classic Racism Without Racists, much as Jim Crow racism served as the glue for defending a brutal and overt system of racial oppression in the pre-civil rights era, colorblind racism serves today as the ideological armor for a covert and institutionalized system in the post-civil rights era. The court's recent decision striking down the use of race in university affirmative action programs is grounded in this colorblind ideology. It holds that because the civil rights laws put people of color and white people in positions of full equality, social policies that take race into account constitute unconstitutional race discrimination. So the court strikes down race conscious remedies aimed at mitigating structural racism, while it upholds policies that are race neutral on their face, but in fact subordinate black and other communities of color. In a move legal scholar Kiara Bridges calls the historical resemblance test, the court only recognizes civil rights violations that resemble the pre-civil rights era. So it rejects contemporary claims of racial injustice by distinguishing the benign motivations of their modern day perpetrators from the blatantly contemptible motivations of historical 
racist actors. The justices point to atrocities committed pre-civil rights, for example, by enslavers, the Klan, the blatantly racist officials like Bull Connor, the movement's vicious adversary in Birmingham, Alabama, as a strategy for excusing today's racist practices, which may seem more subtle, I'm not sure, but they seem different. They seem to pale by comparison to what happened prior to civil rights during the slavery and Jim Crow eras. This ignores how racism in the post-civil rights era operates through institutions, systems, and structures that are rooted in prior slavery and Jim Crow regimes, but reproduced in new ways, new forms. Racism is reproduced, not replicated. This is how abominable acts of anti-black state violence are still possible and deemed acceptable in a post-civil rights America. Despite popular interpretations of Dr. King, he made it very clear that he was not satisfied with civil rights. In his August 16, 1967 presidential address at the 10th annual meeting of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? King began by noting that just 10 years before, when the organization was launched, racial segregation was still a structured part of the architecture of Southern society. He went on to review the movement's amazing accomplishments. In assault after assault, we caused the sagging walls of segregation to come tumbling down, he said. We made our government write new laws that altered some of the cruelest injustices that affected us. And then he describes a divine dissatisfaction with those laws. But in spite of a decade of significant progress, the problem is far from solved, he said. The deep rumbling of discontent in our cities is indicative of the fact that the plant of freedom has grown only a bud, not yet a flower. In his 1967 book with the same title, King declares black people's great disappointment with the federal government and its timidity in implementing the civil rights laws on the statute books. The gap between promise and fulfillment is distressingly wide. He calls the laws extravagant promises a mockery today because the federal government failed to send federal marshals to inhibit Southern terror and otherwise enforce the laws, he wrote that the old way of life, economic coercion, terrorism, murder, and inhumane contempt had continued unabated. Dr. King's analysis of black Americans' dissatisfaction had as much to do with the limits of civil rights laws as their lack of enforcement. King's conclusion that civil rights are not enough was based on his astute political analysis of black people's persistently subordinated status in America. In the two years before he was gunned down, Dr. King promoted a radical structural analysis of the entanglement of white supremacy and poverty. Like other radical activists, he adjusted his strategies after the civil rights laws were passed in response to white backlash and recalcitrance and to his own ethical evolution. A year before his death, Dr. King launched the Poor People's Campaign, which extended the ongoing movement for black people's civil rights to a new call for the radical redistribution of political and economic power. According to historian Peniel Joseph, Malcolm X's assassination in February 1965 and the Watts uprisings in August of that same year marked King's decisive shift in thinking and his transition into what Joseph calls a revolutionary dissident vilified in quarters that once fetted him and a target of the FBI's covert COINTELPRO aimed at destroying the black power movement. 
In a series of lectures delivered in November and December 1967, republished after his assassination as the trumpet of conscience, King attributed the passage of the Civil Rights Acts to the dramatic crisis created by carefully planned mass demonstrations in Birmingham and Selma. And then he observed, of course by now it is obvious that new laws are not enough. Those are King's words. He explained further in A Testament of Hope, also published posthumously, that, quote, the black revolution is much more than a struggle for the rights of Negroes. It is forcing America to face all its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. King also tied together the problem of racism, the problem of economic exploitation, and the problem of war. In his 1967 speech at Riverside Church in New York City, he explained his opposition to the Vietnam War, calling America the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. He would later call out the hypocrisy of the government assault on Vietnam. What kind of nation is it that applauds nonviolence when Negroes face white people in the streets of the United States, but then applauds violence and burning and death when these same Negroes are sent to the fields of Vietnam. In March 1968, a month into the Memphis sanitation workers strike, Dr. King addressed the strikers on a stop in his Poor People's Campaign. He told the workers that their strike reminded us that it is a crime in this rich nation to receive starvation wages. You are highlighting the economic issue, he said. You are going beyond purely civil rights to questions of human rights. Again, King celebrated the movement's prior victories. The civil rights laws, he said, did a great deal to end legal segregation and guarantee the right to vote. But then, once more, King emphasizes the inadequacy of civil rights and the need to move radically beyond them. With Selma and the Voting Rights Bill, one era of our struggle has come to a close and a new era came into being, he declared. Now our struggle is for genuine equality, which means economic equality. For we know that it isn't enough to integrate lunch counters. What does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't earn enough money to buy a hamburger and a cup of coffee? Unlike the dominant view that civil rights are enough, King calls for a new phase of liberation struggle, one that tackles the structural forms of injustice that civil rights laws have not and cannot abolish. To force America to be born again, as King termed it, he called for organizing tens of thousands of poor and working class people and their allies to demand transformative government action to create widespread economic security, including calling for providing jobs and a guaranteed annual income, demolishing slums, and rebuilding communities, what he called a new economic deal. We need not a new law, he said, but a massive new national program. King also tied the new phase of the domestic movement to global freedom struggles, calling it, quote, inseparable from an international emergency which involves the poor, the dispossessed, and exploited of the whole world. Now, King never abandoned his adherence to nonviolence as a political strategy. He rejected armed rebellion on practical as well as moral grounds, 
he argued that organized nonviolent mass protest was more effective and realistic than violent uprisings for black people to gain the power required to bring about revolutionary change. Yet for King, this was a disagreement over tactics more than over the need for radical change. I am not sad that black Americans are rebelling, he wrote in a testament of hope. This was not only inevitable, but eminently desirable. Without this magnificent ferment among Negroes, the old evasions and procrastinations would have continued indefinitely. King didn't even shy away from the urban uprisings exploding in major cities in 1967. I don't mean he participated in them, but he didn't shy away from dealing with them. In the trumpet of conscience, King, repre King presents a brilliant, and I think to many people it will be shocking, defense of the rioters, as they were called then, on grounds that their violence to a startling degree was focused against property rather than against people. King turned his criticism of violence to the military and the police. The much publicized death rate or death toll that marked the riots and the many injuries were overwhelmingly inflicted on the rioters by the military, he said. It is clear that the riots were exacerbated by police action and that was designed to injure or even kill people. That made a moral difference to Dr. King. A life is sacred. Property is intended to serve life, he said. Then, instead of distancing his violent, I'm sorry, his nonviolent movement from the looters, he highlighted their restraint and drew connections to them, interrogating why the looters avoided attacking people but targeted property. King's answer was, because property represents the white power structure which they were attacking and trying to destroy. The uprisings, he said, were directed against symbols of exploitation and designed to express the depth of anger in the community. Then King concludes, I find this so fascinating, if one can find a core of nonviolence toward persons even during the riots when emotions were exploding, it means that nonviolence should not be written off for the future as a force in Negro life. For King, the uprising showed hope for the potential efficacy of organized nonviolent struggle. But he added, not until it has achieved the massive dimensions, the disciplined planning, and the intense commitment of a sustained direct action movement of civil disobedience on a national scale. I reached the conclusion that civil rights aren't enough by focusing throughout my career on the nation's devaluation of black women and our resistance against it. In my first book, Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, published in 1997, I elaborated the long history of regulation of black women's bodies and argued that that history has been crucial to reproductive and racial politics in America from the very beginning. My first research project launched in the late 1980s investigated and challenged the prosecutions of black mothers across the country for being pregnant and using drugs. Racist myths about them giving birth to so-called crack babies, falsely described as irreparably damaged, bereft of social consciousness and destined to delinquency, had turned a public health issue into a crime. I saw the prosecutions as part of a long history of oppressive policies originating in the exploitation of black women's reproductive labor that devalued black women and denied their reproductive freedom. The belief that black women passed down a depraved lifestyle to their children persisted 
after the passage of the civil rights laws and was crucial to the post-civil rights retrenchment that Dr. King condemned. Daniel Patrick Moynihan's 1965 report, The Negro Family, The Case for National Ac Action, that blamed black matriarchs for impoverishment of black ghettos, played a pivotal role in the backlash against the Civil Rights Act passed just the year before. Popular stereotypes of black maternal unfitness circulated throughout subsequent decades with disparaging icons such as the welfare queen, portrayed as having babies just to get a welfare check and then spending all the money on herself as she neglected her children. These myths about black women's hypersexuality and hyperfertility fueled harsh welfare and law enforcement policies directed at the whole nation, especially black communities, but also targeted at black women including mass sterilization of black women through federally funded social service programs, dropping black mothers from their welfare roles and removing black children from their homes to be placed in foster care. Black women's historical experiences of reproductive violation also illuminate the cruel intersection of laws that compel pregnancy and laws that criminalize pregnancy foreshadowing the enormous catastrophe for health and freedom threatened by the U.S. Supreme Court's Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade. And black women's analysis of and struggle for reproductive justice are essential to fighting back. I radically changed my understanding of the freedom struggle as a result of my engagement with the reproductive justice movement and prison abolition movement. For two decades, after publishing my second book, Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare in 2001, I participated in many reform efforts attempting to improve the foster system. I learned the futility of tinkering with a system designed to police poor, indigenous, and other disenfranchised communities. Given its foundational logic centered on threatening the most marginalized families by taking their children, blaming them for harms that are actually caused by poverty and other structural inequities, the system has absorbed efforts to mitigate its flaws and has continued reproducing the harms to children and their loved ones. Instead, as I argue in my latest book, Torn Apart, we need a radical paradigm shift in the state's relationship to families, a complete end to family policing by dismantling the current system and reimagining the very meaning of child welfare, care, and safety. W.E.B. Du Bois attributed the defeat of freedom after the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments to the nation's failure to install what he called abolition democracy. Renowned activist and scholar Angela Y. Davis explains that Du Bois pointed out that in order to fully abolish the oppressive conditions produced by slavery, new democratic institutions would have to be created. True freedom required not only the end to chattel slavery, but also the simultaneous building of a free society for everyone. Like the struggles to abolish slavery, today's abolition struggles aren't just about tearing down systems. An essential aspect of prison abolition theory and activism is that eliminating prisons must occur alongside creating a society that has no need for them. Abolitionists are working toward a reimagined world where all vestiges of slavery are unimaginable. When Dr. King returned to Memphis on April 3rd, 1968, the day before he was murdered, he spoke once more to the striking sanitation workers. He reported on rumors of threats against him by what he called sick white men. And then he issued 
those astoundingly prophetic words. But it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. King goes on to peer into the future and he's allowed me to go to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we as a people will get to the promised land. To the very end, King preached both his dream of a liberated future and the fierce urgency of now. His words, at once tragic and inspiring, remind me of the abolitionist stance. We envision as absolutely possible a world without prisons, family separation, and poverty. A horizon we see far in the future while urgently working toward it right now. I hear King's abolitionist message in the songs of enslaved people who made heaven their home while enacting heaven on earth. They had to imagine a future where slavery didn't exist in order to strive toward freedom in the here and now. Isn't that right? 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 Abolishing slavery meant believing a radically different society was possible and working to create it even while still in bondage. It's amazing. It's amazing. But if they didn't do it, where would we be now? Even worse off. So no, civil rights are not enough. But the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Civil Rights Act of 1866 before it are evidence that mass movements and years, maybe decades, maybe centuries, of committed collective struggle dedicated to justice can topple what seem like unshakable regimes of injustice. That should give us hope to imagine a free, equal, and democratic society where today's unjust systems would be unimaginable. And it gives us a mandate to build with the urgency of now, the beloved community that Dr. King dreamed, lived, and died for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's all take a deep breath, huh? Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Marcia Chatlin, and I have the pleasure of talking to Professor Roberts tonight about her incredible lecture and her incredible scholarship. Um, when Killing the Black Body came out in 1997, I was a freshman in college and everyone had your book. <laughs> and everyone was holding it so close because I think for um, a generation of young people who were kind of growing into consciousness, this was the first time interacting with the ways that black women's stories can tell us about so many things. And a lot. Everything. Essential, <laughs> essential as I was trying to point out in my, in my talk, yeah. And so I took notes during your talk because you covered everything, every idea, and so I had to think about different ways of entering this conversation. And I want to think about you, the structuring of the Civil Rights Act mm -hmm. and the ways that, for many historians, we say, you know, this is the beginning of a modern relationship mm -hmm. of people who had been in a state of rightlessness with the state. Mm -hmm. And so in those initial moments after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, what did people imagine that this piece of legislation could do? Yeah, I think they imagined that it would put an end to segregation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, of course, people were realistic that laws couldn't do everything, but they certainly imagined it would do more than they did. So when King says, we're disappointed, it's, what's happening is a mockery, they assumed that the federal government would send in marshals, would send in uh, people who would watch the polls, just even just talking about voting rights, that the laws would be enforced. And in fact, they weren't being enforced. So uh, they thought that this was a real end to the prior legal regime where it was legally not only permissible, not only acceptable and expected that black people would be subordinated, that violence against black people would not be redressed, uh, that uh, the regime was segregation. You know, that was the official law of the land. And the Civil Rights Act was supposed to end that, again, realistically knowing that it would take further work, but thinking that it would do more than what it did. And in terms of thinking about how closely the passage um, dovetails with Johnson declaring a war on poverty yeah. and King's Poor People's Campaign, yeah. what are some of the ways that I think, you know, the Civil Rights Act structures so much of our ideas about, I have a right to this, yes. the government can't do this, yes. but where do we fill in that gap to the government also provides? the government also has to care. Yes, well that's one of the limitations of civil rights law is that it's structured as a way to claim discrimination against individuals and for those individuals to get some kind of individual redress. Uh, it, it does also provide, I mean we should make it clear, it provides for a civil rights commission that is supposed to investigate and deal with continuing racial discrimination. It provides for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. But those ha are still individualized uh, ways of dealing with discrimination on a person-to-person -person basis. They don't really deal with the kind of structural changes that would be required to end poverty in America. In addition, the war on poverty was immediately met with various ways of diminishing its impact. Uh, in fact, we could look at the war on poverty as being connected then to a backlash that sent police officers into black communities. That was the beginning of the buildup of mass incarceration in America, especially the hyper-incarceration of black people. Um, as I mentioned in, in my lecture, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's report came out a year after the Civil Rights Act was passed and was part of this way of looking at the war on poverty as also requiring a harsh law enforcement containment of black communities. Um, Elizabeth Hinton's uh, book for the war on poverty, the war on crime, I hope I'm saying the title correctly, uh, it, it lays out very clearly the way in which immediately after the war on poverty was launched, there was this backlash to really diminish drastically whatever it could do in terms of ending poverty in America. And of course, we know that it hasn't ended poverty in America. We still are, uh, have the highest rate of poverty, including child poverty, of any Western industrialized nation in the world. And so, uh, it, the, the war on poverty was not what King had in mind with his poor people's campaign. Um, as, as he said, he thought that there should be much more uh, intense and radical government efforts to make sure everyone had a job or a guaranteed income. Oh, okay. One of the issues that you bring up that I think is so illuminating on why these discussions about the past and the present are so difficult to articulate is you talked about how within the legal framework, we are looking for acts of discrimination that have resemblances of the past. Yes. 
So are you being told to sit somewhere? Yes. Are you, um, you know, being intimidated in very explicitly racist ways? Exactly. Meanwhile, yeah. we have an evolving um, set of structures and realities of how racism actually operates. And I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, that insight I think is so helpful in terms of what role do you think legal educators mm -hmm. have in helping practitioners and helping us understand what the law does and doesn't do and how do you pass this memo on to the Supreme Court? <laughs> well, <laughs> that may be an impossible task. We can pass the memo, doesn't mean they're gonna read and accept it. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, and, and I, I cite Kiara Bridges, in her recent, uh, well last year's Harvard Law Review Supreme Court forward uh, presents this, what she calls historic resemblance test, that if acts of racial injury don't resemble the acts prior to the civil rights laws, the court doesn't recognize them. And even though we see very, what seem like very blatant acts of racial discrimination and racial violence, anti-black violence by police officers, for example, killings of unarmed black people, uh, they still, because they don't that the police department hasn't explicitly said it's going to discriminate against black people, then it's not recognized. In addition to all sorts of doctrines of immunity and uh, even a doctrine that you can't bring a lawsuit against the police if their violence, if they didn't know, you know that what they were doing was unconstitutional. I'm talking about you know, a civil rights action under the US Constitution. So it's that, but then also the ways in which structures, you know, the way that mortgages are, uh, are approved, the way that uh, education is uh, distributed in the United States with lower quality schools in black communities, with less resourced schools. And when I say lower quality, I mean not the quality of the people in them, but the resources that they have. Um, the continued residential segregation and disinvestment in black neighborhoods. You know, all of these structural ways that black communities continue to be subordinated, disadvantaged, uh, cut off from the full benefits of society, from political power, the voter suppression campaigns going on that don't, you know, of course, they're not gonna say we're passing a law requiring a voter ID or we're passing a law disqualifying people with felony records from voting. They're not gonna say this is to keep black people from voting. Although I think there have been some uh, people, I mean, people <laughs> recordings that, that uh, have been leaked. But so the, you know, so then the court or anyone who has this historical resemblance to us will say, well, it's not like the Jim Crow era, that was ended, and so it doesn't qualify as racism. And, and as I pointed out also, and others have pointed out, that means then if you take race into account to try to address these continued acts of racism, you know, you know continued policies and practices that preserve white supremacy and, and structural racism, then it looks as if you're discriminating. That's the act of race discrimination. So that the act of reparation becomes another exactly. problem. What exactly, are, yeah, but people will say reparations for what? We passed the civil rights law <laughs> of 1964, so we don't need reparations. The circular logic of it is so infuriating, and one of um, the distinctions of your career has been your ability to shake up our idea of what a protected class is. Mm -hmm. So the Civil Rights Act of 64 um, begins this idea of who is protected under these laws, mm -hmm. but we understand through your research the poor are not fully protected, right. children are not fully protected, yeah. the disabled, black women, um, you know, pregnant people, they're all of these people who, um, again, are in the state of rightlessness, and I'm curious from your perspective, in our colloquial understanding of the Civil Rights Act, do you think that um, we've imagined it as serving the interests of the elite, people who can sue, 
people who can afford discovery and find out that Exxon has been discriminating against black executives. I, I'm curious yeah. about where does it then yeah. rest in terms of all of these people who are excluded from the law? Yeah, so that's another limitation of basing radical change on bringing a lawsuit based on protection of individual rights. You have to be an individual, not only who seems to be deserving of protection, but also someone who has the money or other resources to bring the lawsuit. And you know there are civil rights attorneys, uh, and that is a whole cadre of attorneys who came uh, came up under during the civil rights uh, movement, but also after the passage of the civil rights laws, attorneys who bring lawsuits to seek redress for discrimination, to protect the rights of individuals against discrimination, all forms of discrimination. Uh, but it's not enough to bring about the structural changes that Dr. King and others want to see and that would actually bring into this nation a truly equal and democratic society. And I, I want to emphasize also that, you know, as you point out, a lot of my work has been pointing to really horrible injustices where that I, I see, you know, the, the prosecution of pregnant black women or women who just gave birth and dragging them out of maternity wards because there was a positive drug test, as if that's going to help you know, their babies. And it, to me, it was obvious that this was a devaluation of these women. This was punishing them for having children. Uh, and now my work with, uh, against family policing, uh, along with many activists that are trying to make radical change and abolish this system and replace it with policies and practices and community-based resources that actually support families. But this is a system, you know, when I, when I started working on it in the, well, around the late 1990s, after I published Killing the Black Body, started investigating, it was so obvious to me that this was a racist system. I was in Chicago teaching at Northwestern. If you go into family court, all you see are black mothers pleading to get their children back. I don't know how anyone could look at it and say this is an equal race neutral system. And so there was that. And then my work on the resurgence of biological concepts of race. I mean, I'm just astounded at how today there are scientists who publish articles still based on this idea that some natural force divided human beings into races and automatic changes in medicine and medical technology that's still widespread where if you're black there's an automatic adjustment in the output. So I mean these are just some examples. I feel like my whole career is about pointing out to people this is unjust, but the, but the law doesn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. So what is that about? I mean, how can it be that something so violent as taking someone's children away because they're impoverished, you know, because they're houseless, the answer is to take their children away from them? You know, how could it be that we have in America, in, I just saw an article in the New York Times, black women in New York City are nine times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications right. than white women in New York City. Now, how can this be? How can it be that we know that during the COVID lockdown, when families were getting income support, it cut, drastically cut the child poverty rate, but then now Congress says, oh no, but we're gonna end that policy, and we see the child poverty rate go up, and that's considered humane and democratic and just and advanced and developed, you know, we're a developed nation. So I could go on and on with all these examples. How is it that that happens? And part of it is because of these underlying assumptions that there are certain people who just aren't equally human. They don't deserve. 
They don't even deserve to live, let alone to thrive. And so that's something we have to tackle, we have to end as we're working toward a society that is truly democratic, truly equal, truly caring, truly loving. I was happy that uh, President Jameson pointed out that quote from Dr. King where he talks about the connection between love and power. Power should be to implement love and love without power is too weak. I don't know if that's the exact quote, but that's part of what King said in, that, in, in his um, where do we go from here speech. So um, that's all of what we have to do and just focusing on redressing individual people's rights within this framework that's already so limited. Uh, and you know, I want to highlight what you asked earlier. I don't think I, I mentioned it or, or emphasized it enough when you said it's framed in what do we have protections against the government? You know, what are our protections against government interference, which is important, but it leaves out what should we demand of government to provide? And both of them are equally important and our whole civil rights and constitutional jurisprudence are all set up around these negative rights, which aren't even in force for everybody, but don't go to the positive right to be able to feed your family, the positive right to have housing, the positive right to have health care. That's why I think King said we have to go from civil rights to human rights. Those are human rights that everyone should be entitled to in a truly free and democratic society. In a moment in which it seems like the lowest common denominator wins, is it legal? Then it's fine. Is it, yeah. um, is it against the law? No, okay, it's fine. Yeah. To elevate ourselves politically and socially and in community to is it ethical? Is it yes. moral? Yeah. Is it loving? Yes. Is so, it's so much what you provide us and is so much of what King's legacy is about. And as we enter I mean, who the hell knows what we're entering next? I but know. as we enter an election season, a moment in which many people are asked, what are we moving toward? Yes. Um, can you help us think about <laughs> some things that are not just legal, but just, that we can all move toward? Yeah. Well, I think we should move to our more loving society. I think that's one of the gifts of Dr. King is that he wasn't afraid to say that love and power are, must be jointly manifested, jointly supported. And he was talking about you know, equal distribution of power in the United States and a nation that put love into its ethos, its morality. Uh, can we say that? I, I remember when I would have been afraid to use the word on a stage. Mm -hmm or <laughs> anywhere in academia, you, you were considered ridiculous to talk about love. But we need a more caring society. How can we, going forward, think about what care actually means? Care has been so distorted by the dominant way of thinking about law and policy, where care is twisted so that you only get care if you conform. Mm. You know, you, to get care for the most marginalized people in America, and I mean impoverished white people, black people, indigenous people, other people who are LGBTQ people, people who are not considered the valuable upstanding members of society, the elite, to get care you often have to subject yourself to some kind of supervision and even violence. Mm. I mean, this is the case with our so-called child welfare system, a family policing system. How do you get care in that system? 
Well, you get care if you've been accused of maltreating your children mm -hmm. and you're under supervision of the system and you comply with everything they tell you to do for fear that you're never going to get your children back. You know, how do you get care if you have a substance abuse disorder? Very often you only get it if you subject yourself to judicial oversight. And it might be on, if you don't do what the judge says, you're going to prison. So now the care is linked. There's I mean, so many ways care is linked to carceral systems of punishment, even schools now. Yeah. You know, you're only gonna get a good education or an education in many inner city schools if you subject yourself to police officers inspecting you in the halls. So that is, you know, I, I know people are even saying, well, maybe we need a different word than care because it's been so taken over by these punitive ideas <laughs> that you have to deserve the care. Mm -hmm. You have to be monitored to get the care. And you have to be punished if you, with the care taken from you if you don't follow all the rules. And so I hope that we don't need a new word that we can reimagine what care means and we can, moving forward, think about how can we actually institute care, not only in government laws and policies, I think those are important, but also in the way we interact with each other in our communities. You know, we're in a state now, a condition now in the United States, where the police power and the police state is growing in every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our lives. And people will find it hard to get any support from the government. And as you said, who knows? Will any of it exist? If you, maybe you have to be rich to, to get the resources you need to care for yourself and your family, to have your basic human needs met. That could be the case. So if that is the case, and it's already moving toward there, then we need to figure out networks of care, mutual aid in our communities. How do we help each other? How do we be more caring to each other? Uh, I, I don't, I'm someone who doesn't want to leave the government off the hook. I know some people I work with say, we can't depend on the state at all. We just have to have our own mutual aid in our communities. I, and more in line with Dr. King and say, we should demand that the state provide for our human needs. That's a human right. But I do think that we have to be more willing and more attentive to the needs of all of us in our networks, whether it's our communities, our departments, <laughs> our, our friends, our families, and uh, think about in this era how we are going to build and create, despite what seem like impossible odds, more loving communities in our own circles, as well as spreading it out as much as we can. Well, on behalf of this incredible audience, this incredible scholar, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks so much. Thank Thank you very much. Um, now, on behalf of the Center for Africana Studies, I would, it is my pleasure to present uh, a gift to our honorary, uh, the MLK uh, um, honorary of 2024.